Welcome back. Thank you for enduring through to the last section, session, session six. The mission has now begun. We started off with an impossible task in front of us. And now we find if we have followed through eventually after rejection and rejection and rejection, the good news is if you are faithful to continually share, you're going to be in a position to lead someone to Christ. And the question then is, now what? Now what do I do? You know, it's important for us to realize that evangelism is only part of the Great Commission. It's not the whole Great Commission. The Great Commission calls us to discipleship, and evangelism is step one of that discipleship. Earlier we talked about every believer being charged with evangelism. All of us are called to evangelize. But we also realize that every believer is also charged with sanctification. Big fancy church word meaning helping people grow in their faith. Helping ourselves grow in our faith. So every believer is charged with evangelism and every believer is also charged with sanctification. So how do we help someone grow in their faith? Now that they have accepted Christ, how do we help them to Go to the next step. Well, there's a thousand different discipleship models. I've given you one that I highly recommend, and I'll, I'll share with you uh, here a little bit later on how you can use that. But uh, this New Life in Christ is a 13-week study that is phenomenal. It is a great resource that you can sit down with a person and invest, yes, 13 weeks to sit down and meet someone and say, here's what you do now that you're a believer. It goes over everything from, from how to accept Christ to getting involved in a church to the security we have in Christ to uh, many questions they may have that you don't have the answers to. And while it seems like a big task to sit down with a person on a regular basis, uh, we're going to look in just a minute why it's vitally important that we invest in people. And I will say as important as leading someone to Christ. And I'll share with you that in just a moment. In general, whatever discipleship model you want to use, however you want to, to help someone grow in their faith, there are five characteristics that I want to share with you of a mature Christian. Five ways you want to see someone grow. So we're going to go through these very briefly. The first is really obvious and really simple. You've just done it with them. And that is that they are converted. They are converted. Fancy word for meaning they have accepted Christ. A mature Christian has a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. Good news. If you're looking for a mature Christian, you've already helped them at this point. If you've got to session six, it's because you've asked the questions, you've led them to Christ, they've responded positively, and they are genuinely saved. Secondly, a characteristic of a mature Christian is that they crave the word. Craving the Word. A mature Christian longs for more knowledge about God. So as you're discipling someone, whatever method or model you decide to use, you want to make sure they're reading the Word of God regularly. A great place to start is in the book of John. Just tell them to start by reading one chapter of John a day, and that will get them through 21 days, three weeks. And when they're done with John, three weeks later, let's keep going. Let's don't even stop. The next book is a book of Acts. Keep going. There's 28 chapters in Acts. That gets them four more weeks. If they can do that and commit to reading a chapter a day, they can read through the book of John and Acts in seven weeks, and they'll have an opportunity to learn more about what the Bible says. They'll start to develop this craving for the Word of God. Thirdly, a mature Christian is churched. They're involved in a local church. A mature Christian regularly worships with others. Whatever you decide to use, whether you're meeting with them on a weekly basis or whether you're just trying to help follow up, it's important that they get plugged into a local congregation. If you're local, if you are here in Robinson, Illinois, invite them to come to church and to Sunday school with you. Come be a part of our church family. If you're away from the area, if you're on some mission somewhere or maybe just on vacation visiting somewhere, find a church that, that believes similar to what you believe and help them get involved in that church. Encourage them to go and talk to their pastor and to get involved and plugged in. A mature Christian not just attends church from time to time, but regularly worships with others. Fourth, 
A mature Christian is consecrated. Boy, this is a fancy word. But it goes along with my C alliteration, so it's going to be consecrated. That literally means to be set apart. A mature Christian looks different from the world. That means as you're sharing with someone how they can have a relationship with Christ and grow in their faith, you're encouraging them to do things that are modeled after the Word of God and not modeled after the world. Now, does that mean they have to cut their hair different and dress different and be modeled and formed exactly like you? No. Remember, there's diversity in the body of Christ. But they are to stand out when it comes to how they live their lives. Those sins that they were involved in before are going to have to be addressed. Maybe not all at once because it feels overwhelming, but as they read the Word, as they're involved in a local church, the things that they're used to doing may have to change and be different. They must be set apart and different from the world around them. Fifth and finally, a mature believer has compassion for the lost. A mature Christian recognizes others' need for the gospel. You know, part of discipleship is not just, here's everything I know about the Bible. Part of discipleship is saying, I led you to Christ. Now you need to go and do the same with someone else. I mean, the same reasons why you feel convicted to share the gospel, your new brother or sister in Christ ought to develop those same convictions. They know people that are lost and going to hell. They know people whose lives are broken and in need of salvation. They know the culture around them that is progressively getting more and more evil and away from God. And they will start to develop this compassion for lost people. I would encourage them to take this course, to sit down, and they don't have to be a, a great mature Christian. This is part of their maturity. Go ahead, maybe even as soon as you're done leading them through this, this discipleship study, the very next thing you do is say, let's go sit down and take this evangelism study together and help them to see the need for them to share the gospel. Discipleship is so vitally important. It's impossible for the, the Christian mission to spread the gospel to happen without this discipleship. I, I want to share with you two scenarios as we kind of wrap this study up. Two scenarios of evangelism, if you will. In the first scenario, I'm going to call mass revival. Let's pretend for a minute that we take this and what we've learned and we can lead 50,000 people to Christ every single day. Let's pretend we can do that. Sounds impossible, I know, but hey, with God, all things are possible, right? So let's pretend that we can do this. 50,000 people every single day consistently for the foreseeable future. We're going to lead this mass revival. Scenario number two is where instead of leading 50,000 people to Christ, we lead one person to Christ and we disciple them for six months and teach them how to lead someone else to Christ. I call this faithful discipleship. Mass revival, 50,000 people a day, seems impossible. Faithful discipleship, you're targeting on one. You're leading them to Christ and helping them lead others to Christ. Every six months you repeat this model. Six months' time, one salvation, one discipleship process, and then there's two of you doing the same thing, and so on and so forth. After one year, one year of these two models, with mass revival, you will have led 18,250,000 people to Christ. That's pretty much the state of Illinois. In one year, 50,000 people, our entire state, is one to Christ. If you do the faithful discipleship, guess how many people you have after one year? Four. All right, so we're a little behind the eight ball so far. Maybe I'm not making a great point. We could have Illinois one if we can get these 50,000. Right now, in year one, there's just four of us. A small but faithful group. After six and a half years of doing each of these models, Sustaining 50,000 salvations a day for six and a half years. The entire East Coast state, every state that touches the East Coast, has now received the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And after six and a half years, we've seen some success with our faithful discipleship. And we see roughly 8,000 people come to Christ. And that's, that's roughly the size of Robinson, right? I mean, so after six and a half years, there is some success, but it pales in comparison so far to this faithful or this, this mass evangelism model. 
So we go into year 12. Again, if we can sustain it for 12 years, we would see everyone east of the Mississippi in the mass revival saved. Every person east of the Mississippi is a believer in Jesus Christ. Again, this is hard to do, 50,000 people, but we can see the results happening and it sounds wonderful. And we're still behind after 12 years. Certainly it's working, but after one year of mass revival, the entire state was saved. Now, after 12 years of this faithful discipleship, we finally won our own state. We're still behind because, because we see mass revival is, is won everyone east of the Mississippi. But... A funny thing happens at 14 and a half years. After we do these two models, at, at, at this point we see, we see a jump. And, and after 14 and a half years, there are 264,265 people, I'm sorry, 264 million, 265,000 people saved with mass revival. A huge number. But with faithful discipleship in that same span, the entire United States has accepted Christ. They've jumped one person at a time, six months investing in them and helping them to lead someone else to Christ. Now we look at these two models and which one is doable? Can we sustain 50,000 people? Absolutely not. Can we invest in one person? Boy, pastor, it's a lot to take someone through 13 weeks of study. Well, yeah, but look at the results. Pastor, it's a lot to, to commit on a weekly basis. Not only are you asking me to share my faith, but you want me to teach them and train them and, and, and do all of this? We see the results are, are infinite. What's amazing to me is, is not just 14 and a half years. Look what happens at 16 and a half years. There are 301 million people with mass revival, but at 16 and a half years, there's 8 and a half billion people with the faithful discipleship method. The entire world has come to Christ in less than a score of years. Which model do you think is more effective? Let's get out and win as many as we can and let them figure it out. Or let's get out there and teach them how to do what we're doing. Let's get out there and, and teach them how to be in the Word and teach them how to share their faith with others. Let's go out one by one, and then it'll be two by two, then it'll be four by four, and there'll be 16, and so on and so forth. You know, it's funny because it takes 17 and a half years to win the United States to Christ at 50,000 50, people a day. If we go this same model, it takes us 466 years to finally win the world to Christ. We don't have enough time. I don't see enough Methuselahs out there. Not only is the, the mass evangelism model uh, impractical, it's impossible. But you and I can invest in one person. You and I can, can pour into an individual on a weekly basis. Hey, let's get together and let's meet sometime. Maybe we do it during a... a, a evening time. Maybe we do it before or after church. Maybe we just do it sitting and having lunch or dinner together. Maybe just come over to my house and, and we'll talk about it while we share a meal. Maybe we set up a formal time to meet, whatever it works. But, but instead of just trying to win people, why don't we invest in people? You know, we find that, that the calling as a Christian is not just to evangelize. It's called to disciple. And evangelism is the first and, and hardest step to overcome. But from that point on, we just see the gospel able to explode simply by Christians doing what the Bible has already laid out for us to do. Go and make disciples. When we look at this, is our mission so impossible after all? I mean, certainly there's hurdles, and I'm not suggesting that, that 16 and a half years from now, Christianity will be the only religion on the planet. I, I understand there are barriers, and I understand there, there are fears, and there are comforts to overcome, but isn't all of that an excuse? <coughs> Hasn't God called us to invest? Hasn't God called us to disciple? Let's close this, this time in a word of prayer. Father, I, I thank You that while our task seems impossible, with You nothing is impossible. 
Lord, it's amazing with all the strategies we can lay out and, and what we should be doing or shouldn't be doing and, and how we're trying to reach as many people as we can and we've got all these programs. Lord, we read your word and it just says, go out and make disciples. Go out and lead people to Christ and teach them how to lead people to Christ. Lord, it's funny how your program far outweighs anything we can come up with. Lord, give us the, the wisdom to share our faith and invest, to lead people through the gospel presentation, lead them to Christ, and then, and then pour into their lives and let them grow in their faith. And Lord, then turn them loose to share their faith with others. Lord, I thank you for, for the gospel because it does have the power to save. Lord, I thank you that it saved me and I thank you that it can save anyone who is willing to confess to you. Let us be faithful to share that gospel message with others and see your word explode. It's in your name we pray. Amen. As we come to our, our closing here, we're, we're done with our training per se. Some of you have pizza to get to, but um, maybe...